Friends and enemies, welcome to yet another edition of the Canadian Bitcoiners podcast. I'm Len Det, and I'm going to be joined here today with Daniel Kuman. Daniel, how are you, brother? I'm doing great, Len. How are you? Wonderful. Thanks so much for coming on our show. For people who are unaware, Dan has been on our show. Um, it's been a while, almost more than a year and a half. So December 2021 was the last time he's been on our show. Just want to thank him for coming on. He's going to be joining me in this endeavor to talk to Brian Kernahan, and we'll be talking about obviously Unix, C programming, a lot of things we'll be talking about. And Daniel's going to help provide some technical expertise with this. So Dan, thanks so much for giving some time to do this. This is going to be awesome. Um, but before we go any further, I just want to talk about two sponsors. Sponsor number one, we have Easy DNS. And of course, for DNS services, they got you covered. It's in their name. It's Easy DNS. Email hosting services, got that too. So if you want to migrate your Email over to them. You could do that. No problem. You could then get your personalized email that's associated to your domain. You could look professional or at least appear to be one with your own personalized email address. And it's a company that we use for the Canadian Bitcoiners podcast for hosting our web services. So it's, we've been using it for quite some time. Been around since 1998. So a lot of companies have come and gone with this, but they stuck around. Why? Because they provide quality of service that is par to none. And if you talk to them, and you mention our name, you will get a little bit of a discount on your first buy. So check them out. They're privacy focused and they're fast, easy to use the whole nine yards. But second one, we have Bull Bitcoin and they've made a big splash in the past little while with their KYC free buys. And you can buy your Bitcoin from them, sell your Bitcoin from them. You can pay your, your bills with Bitcoin. You could buy gift cards with Bitcoin. So you can live under the Bitcoin standard just the way Satoshi Nakamoto intended you to do so. But you can buy Lightning, you can buy Liquid on chain, whole nine yards. Last thing you could do, of course, is the KYC free buy. 6,000 locations throughout Canada. You could do that. You could exchange your fiat to a Canada Post and get some KYC free buys. And so don't be a no coiner. Use their services. Use a referral code below by doing that. And by signing up and funding your account, 21 bucks will be added to your account. But yeah, that's it. That's the, <laughs> the formalities out of the way. Let's bring in the man of the hour, Dr. Brian Kernahan. I want to just say thank you very much for coming on our show. I, Dan and I are awfully uh we're very happy you came on the show like this is a huge honor for us both of us and it's not just us our viewers and listeners brian how are you i'm doing fine thank you very much I'm, uh, <laughs> you could downplay the honor stuff but it's a pleasure to talk to you both we'll see how this goes no i, I even have to show you i have one of your books with, with the nice authored between yourself and the late dennis ritchie this is the c book lord that looks like one of the indian Eastern economy editions. <laughs> Still well used. I've used it quite a bit. So um yeah, that book it's it's a godsend to a lot of people who are trying to learn and use the C programming language. But I just want to ask you, because we do have one thing that we share in common. We both went to the school University of Toronto. Many moons ago you were there. I want to just hear about your not just your experience. What did you study over there? Because it, from mm -hmm. what I understand. <laughs> computer science wasn't really a thing at the time when you first attended University of Toronto. So I want to hear what you did over there, what you studied, and uh, your thoughts of going to school at University of Toronto. Yeah, so <clears throat> I was at U of T uh, from 1960 to 64. So this is definitely back in the dark ages. Um, I was in what was at the time called engineering physics, and that was very shortly after rebranded as engineering science, and it I, continues to this day. Uh, and that that was a program for people who were sort of interested in vaguely technical things, but didn't have a clue what they wanted to do. And so it <laughs> it was definitely a weed out kind of course, but we got math, physics, and chemistry like the math, physics, and chemistry people, and we got engineering like all the engineering people. And uh, it was the hardest I think I've ever worked in my life, but it was a lot of fun. I made good friends there. Um, <clears throat> and it certainly was a solid background. This was early enough in the history of computing that there were almost no computers at Toronto. There was an IBM 7094, which provided uh, computing services basically for the university, whatever that was. I don't know what people did with it, really. And there was an IBM 1630, if I remember the numbers right, some very small computer, you know, it was small for the time. It was about the size of a desk and it had a typewriter like thing on the, uh, that you used to communicate with it. And I think that was owned by somebody uh, in the electrical engineering department. I'm not sure. And I, 
I played with it very, very briefly, but didn't really understand what I was doing. And I wrote, in retrospect, must, what must have been utterly trivial, but not working Fortran programs for the 1794. <laughs> um, and so my contact with computing was kind of minimal at the time, unfortunately. Uh, just enough to think this stuff is interesting, but I wasn't really sure why which is kind of a weird way to do it, but it was so early in uh, the field of computing. And so the comparison with today is uh, <laughs> yeah, very hard to, to make real for people, let's say, of your age. <laughs> in, in terms of how you interacted with the machine, was that the time when punch cards was all the, the, uh, the, the glory and everything was, everything was done with that? Yeah, the certainly 7090 series with punch cards, that was the way you did it. And uh, that you can imagine, it's hard to imagine how clunky and awkward that was, but it did force you to think about what you were going to do before you send it to the computer because it might take anywhere from you know an hour to a couple of days before you got your the results back. I am not sure it is dimly possible that that little IBM machine used paper tape, but it's also possible it used card readers. The thing is, card readers are very expensive because they're a fairly sophisticated piece of. Reading mechanical device, um, whereas a paper tape reader was a lot cheaper. And so I wouldn't be surprised to find it was paper tape, but I just, that's blurred at this point. And I really didn't use it very much. Oh. Did, I'm wondering, did any of that experience inspire you to get into computing to make it better? Or was, was it uh, just something that you, that you were doing as part of your coursework? It wasn't part of coursework, interestingly enough. It, it somehow or other, I got interested in independently of that. I stumbled across a book on Fortran programming by Dan McCracken, who had written sort of several of the standard uh, programming textbooks that were quite good at the time, sort of how to do it. But it, it was not, as far as I know, part of any course. The, the department was, or whatever department, the engineering department was pretty traditional in a lot of ways and computing was newfangled. And so I don't think any of it found its way into the curriculum at that point, although it was certainly part of, say, research activities by faculty and things like that. And, but, oh, sorry. Yeah. I, well, no, carry on. Uh, I, I was going to ask you that. So following your studies at U of T, then you spent some time the rest of your time, I guess, in the United States. So was it MIT that you immediately went to after University of Toronto or was it Bell Labs? Was that going to be your next stop? Uh, none of the above. Actually, I went to Princeton as a graduate student. I applied to a bunch of American universities and I honestly don't know why. I think it's probably the usual thing that when people finish undergraduate, they're not sure what they want to do next. And so staying in school is the easiest way to punt the decision over the horizon. Um, and, and I could have stayed at Toronto, but you know, for whatever reason, I decided to let me try something different. And I wound up at Princeton, which in retrospect turned out to have been a really good deal. Um, Cause I was there as a grad student for sort of four and a half years. I did spend one summer at MIT as an intern. And that's maybe where the, the uh, image comes from. Uh, I spent, I guess after I'd been at Princeton for two years, I spent the summer at MIT, and I was working in the Project Mac operation, which was basically doing the Multix operating system. And that's where I got exposed to really interesting computing that was much nicer to use than punch cards, very much nicer, because it was time sharing systems and right on the cutting edge of what people were doing with computing. Um, and also using languages that were better than Fortran in a lot of ways. So, so it was all very illuminating but it took sort of two years to get to that point of uh, two years of grad school. And that you were doing a uh, PhD, correct? That's right. Princeton. Yeah. Okay. So I, I, uh, I've listened to a, a few other shows that you've done and you, am I right in saying that you, you met Alfred Aho when you were doing your PhD or maybe even undergrad? No, Al, Al it, it's Aho. Um, Al was, oh, uh, Aho an undergrad at Toronto, and he was a year ahead of me, also in engineering physics. And so I knew him sort of, you know, somewhat there. Uh, he, he and I were on some or other activity together. So I knew him there, and then he went to Princeton, and I'm sure that's a part of the reason why 
I went to Princeton as well. He's a super, super nice guy. Um, and, and we've been good friends essentially forever. So um, I followed him to Princeton and then he went to Bell Labs permanently in I think about 67 or 68 and I followed him to Bell Labs. <laughs> so uh, where he and I were colleagues and he was my boss at, from time to time, things like that. So Bell Labs is where a lot of legend was created uh, because of what was done and what was created over there. And you were part of it. You were part of the team. You've seen history take place. And I was saying in a previous episode of our show, basically what was done over there, it helped shape what we are we have right now in terms of computers, in terms of um, Mac OS, Windows, Linux, iOS, everything we use today. It's due to what you and your colleagues did over there. So the, the body of work that you guys have done, it's unparalleled. And I just, you know, people need to understand how much work was done over there. And it, it's impossible to overlook exactly what was done. It was just phenomenal. I just want to ask you a question, though. When you got there and you started working with a team at Bell Labs, did you have any clue, even an inkling, that you guys were creating computer history? No, not a clue whatsoever. Are you kidding? <laughs> If I could see see the future, I wouldn't have to do you know things like this. I could you know be on an island in the Caribbean or something like that. <laughs> no, uh, no, and, and it's funny. Even th there's a lot more that was done at Bell Labs that has influenced what we're doing because it wasn't just the software; it was the hardware. I mean, the transistor was invented at Bell Labs. Integrated circuits were not. That was done elsewhere, but. The transistor, which is the fundamental thing that makes a lot of our electronics work, was Bell Labs in the late 1940s. Um, things like fiber optics, which is, of course, the reason why we can speak to each other so effectively over a long distance, uh, was bits and pieces of it invented there and refined, so to speak. Uh, also, the lasers that make it possible to actually put the light pulses on the fiber. So all of that stuff came from Bell Labs, but that was hardware. Um, and then, of course, there was the mathematical stuff like uh, Shannon's uh, theory of communication, information theory kind of stuff that was done there. And also error correcting codes, which is the reason that you and I can talk to each other, even though the connection is kind of ratty, error correcting codes put it back together again. And so those were sort of mathematical things, but on the edge of what you want to do with computing. And then, of course, comes all of the software related stuff that you can build on top of it. But I don't, I will make a bet that hardly anyone had any sense of what effects would be over a long period of time. Um, and certainly some aspects of it have worked out very much better than I think anybody could reasonably have guessed. Now it's survivor bias, you gotta be really careful, right? Because there's lots of other things that didn't work and so they don't have that kind of conversation. I don't think, People are aware how big Bell Labs was, and maybe to a degree still is. The budget in which it had, I heard a story, and maybe you, you could be better at explaining exactly how big the budget is, because it, in today's terms, it would be astronomical. I don't want it to, to talk about what it is in today's dollars, but in terms of how much money they were gathering for every bill that was being sent out, I guess, to people's homes for their bell services. Maybe you could talk about the, the budget which they had and which it funneled down to the projects that you guys were working on. So I don't actually know what the budget would be in dollars, although I guess given time, I could make up some numbers. But the deal was that at the time, let's call this from the 1950s to the probably 1980s, uh, most telephone service in the United States was provided by at and so it was a company with over a million people providing telephone service and they were vertically integrated. They did everything from growing trees that would make telephone poles through to you know sending out bills and, and, and all of that kind of thing. Um, they realized very early, like in the 1920s, that to do this well, they had to have a part of the company that could think about the future, that didn't just focus on you know, what do we do today, but could think about what are we going to do in five or 10 years. And that was the genesis of Bell Labs, which I think started roughly 1925 or something like that. It was people who were supposed to think about 
how to improve telephone service. And, and that covered a very broad spectrum of things. And um, most of that was in the early days, obviously hardware and related things. But then as computers started to slowly inch into the world in the, let's call it the 1950s, um, Bell Labs started to invest in computing as well. So AT&T had well over a million people. Uh, Bell Labs at its peak, I will guess, was roughly 30,000 people. But that included development as well as research. And so research was a smallish part of the Bell Labs operation. And depending on who and how and what you counted, maybe call it 1,500, 2,000 people, many of whom had advanced degrees in whatever field, typically physical sciences, but also math and later on when it became possible, even computer science. But when I got there, degrees in computer science were very, very, very rare because no schools offered a degree in computer science. Right? That didn't happen until roughly the mid to late 60s in the very earliest schools. So like my degree is in electrical engineering. Uh, so, so what the budget was, I have no idea. But if you figure at the time that you were paid X dollars, uh, in at the time, I, I don't even remember. I think my starting salary might have been 15,000 a year or something like that back in the 60s. Uh, and then you had to probably roughly double that as overhead because you had to provide support staff and equipment and buildings and pay taxes and who knows what else. Um, the way that Bell Labs was funded was, in effect, a tax on telephone service. So every time somebody made a phone call in the United States, a little tiny slice of that went to Bell Labs with the explicit goal of let's improve the telephone system. And so it was a pretty reasonable way of doing business. And it meant that the funding was very stable. You could predict probably within a percent or so what the revenue would be over the next year or two. And so that meant that the, the phone company, AT&T and Bell Labs could take a very long-term view of what was important. And so they could afford to have people fooling around on different things, some of which would pay off and some of which wouldn't pay off. But they didn't worry too much about which ones were which. And they didn't have this, what have you done for us this week kind of mentality that I think you see more often today. And so that had a lot of advantages. And it meant people could think about and work on things whose payoff wasn't immediately obvious. And that's part of the reason, I guess, <laughs> this, this, how do you predict what would have happened we weren't very good at that because we were sort of fooling around on things that looked like it would make it more fun and easy to compute in the particular group I was in. You know, how do you make a better environment for doing your own computing? Yeah, it's so fascinating. I think I think uh, you all succeeded at making telephone uh, operations better than they were. So <laughs> I think it all worked out. Um, I'm interested in what the work environment was like at Bell Labs with so many uh, great minds what was it like? Was, was it, was it really collaborative? Was it more competitive? Uh, could you shed some light on that? Yeah. I, collaborative is absolutely the word. It was not competitive. It's certainly in any part of the environment where I was, it was very much more uh, cooperative. And so here's something that's very different from today. Everybody had their own office, you know, a private office. Okay. <laughs> That's unheard of in technology today, unless you're fairly far off in the organization. So everybody had a private office, but most people operated with their doors open. And so if you had an interesting question, you could walk along and ask somebody. And typically they would drop whatever they were doing and talk to you about it. And that that kind of collaborative model of we're, you know, you've got a problem, maybe I can help you work across all kinds of boundaries inside the labs. You know, it's been a long time. This is probably some rosy glow of remembering, but, you know, for the most part, I think it really was that way. And certainly the two or three corridors where people who are working on Unix related things were, had that property for sure. The doors were open, people were doing their own thing, but when if somebody wanted to ask something or talk or just, you know, shoot the breeze, it was absolutely a normal thing to do. <clears throat> and then we also had a kind of a bullpen room <clears throat> that was called the Unix room, which was, you know, I don't know, 10 meters on a side or something like that. 
with computer terminals and chairs and desks and you know, various pieces of junk scattered around that people could hang out and a coffee machine uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, and that was another way that people would collaborate. And there were some people who worked exclusively in that room and there were others who worked essentially in their own offices and people migrated back and forth. It was, a, it was that, in that sense, a very, very uh, good environment. And then the other thing is that that was just, you know, one part of, but at least where I was in, at Bell Labs in Murray Hill, um, it was a very, very, very large building or collection of connected buildings. And so there were, you know, easily a couple of thousand people sharing that approach to what you were doing. And so if you had a question about something else, like how transistors work or astronomy or something, you could find somebody to talk to. Yeah, I, uh, so I, I came out of academia as well. And it, that kind of environment is very prevalent, um, at least at the, the institutions that I, I went through, um, especially throughout my, my uh, doctoral studies. We worked really closely uh, with the hospital system. And you could always find somebody, like you work really closely with mechanical engineering, electrical engineering. And then you can also find you know, neurologists if you have questions about how, how certain parts of the brains function. So I, I came out of that environment and then went into tech where it was much different. <laughs> it was like, uh, yeah. And then most recently I spent about a year and a half working completely remote, which was fine. I, I, I like kind of being on my own, but I did feel like I lacked a little bit of inspiration. We would have team meetings and things and one-on-ones if you needed, but a lot of it, you were just communicating over Slack or GitHub. And I did find that, you know, although it was nice to, to kind of have my own hours and sit in my house for most of the day, I did, I did find it a little challenging to, to, you know, be motivated and creative. Um, it was, you know, it was a little bit more difficult. So it's, I'm always interested in how people view uh, the, the current work situation. Yeah. I, I think that, I think that that working from home, working remotely, is good for some things, but it's just desperately bad for other things. And I think that, well, for example, I, I spent some time, uh, in fact, interning at Google um, in New York, which is about you know, 70, 80 kilometers from me at this point. Um, and I would do that in the summer as a kind of a center, summer internship. <clears throat> And the trouble was the commute was two hours each way, and that was deadly. But the alternative, working at home, then it was really hard to have those sort of hallway conversations or the chance encounters or the very high bandwidth communication back and forth where you're trying to explain a problem and get somebody else's help with it, things like that. And so I think some combination of work from home sometimes and work from a really convenient office other times is good. And I wouldn't mind working in the office all the time if the commute was short. But the commute, you know, a commute longer than half an hour or something is just, uh, it's too much. Yeah, I, I do miss the days of walking around uh, the halls of universities and just, yeah, by, you're, you're saying chance encounters. Yeah, you bump into somebody and they ask you what you're working on. You ask them what they're working on and all of a sudden you've got some totally new project that you can both spend time thinking about and procrastinate yeah. on some of the other things you're doing. So yeah. I do miss those days. Somebody's asking in the audience, he says, or he asks, you worked on the, the Murray Hill, New Jersey location. And he asked, did you ever work in the Homdale, New Jersey location? If so, what are your impressions? Yeah, Homdale. Um, Homdale. So, uh, AT&T was very big. It was all over the country. Bell Labs, a lot of it was concentrated in New Jersey. The a big part of research, much of research, was at Murray Hill, which was, oh, I don't call it 40, 50 kilometers west, southwest-ish of New York. Homedale was sort of the same distance, almost due south of New York, I guess. And that had a much bigger development component, but a also a, an outpost of research. So I used to visit Homedale from time to time. Uh, but I never actually spent any serious time. It was more like you'd be down for an afternoon and talk to people and come back again. Um, that building that they have has been in the news off and on over the, and this may be the trigger for the question, uh, 
has been in the news off and on for the last probably 10 or 20 years because as AT&T sold these things off and became a different company and so on, the building, <clears throat> which is very large and held probably four or 5,000 people, uh, was sort of empty and it's gradually been converted into something. I don't know whether it's condos or <laughs> it's just bizarre. And I haven't been back to it since any of that happened. <clears throat> I bet you it's changed quite a bit. If you go to the back there again and take a look, and I, I just want to touch a little bit on, or actually a little bit more than a little bit on Unix. And Unix was a creation out of the Bell Labs in the time you were there. And I want to just—it's a two-part question. Number one, what spearheaded this? What was the reason why Unix was created? And secondly, it was this solely done by Ken Thompson, or did he have help from other people as well? So. The, the genesis is that the Multics project, basically. The Multics project was this effort at MIT led by uh, Fernando Corbato and a couple of other people to create what amounted to a successor to CTSS. So going back in history, CTSS, the compatible time sharing system dating from, call it 6345, something like that, a time sharing system so that it's like cloud computing today, but it was back in the day and there was a computing server and people connected to it remotely. Great idea, wonderful. And the computer simulated everybody having their own computer just by being fast enough that when I was blathering, it was computing for somebody else. So CTSS is very successful. Could we make another version of it, which was more like a computing utility, something where you could just dial in and do computing. You know, this style all sounds you know, totally modern at this point, but back in the 60s, it was kind of a, a neat new idea. And so Multix was the multiplexed information and computing system or service or something like that. And it was a joint project of MIT, which provided the place and a lot of the technical expertise of uh, time sharing system, Bell Labs, which was actually very, very solid in operating systems and other kinds of software development. And oddly enough, General Electric, which at the time made computers as well as locomotives and dishwashers or whatever. So, so it was this bizarre combination, but MIT is in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Bell Labs was in Murray Hill, New Jersey. Uh, and General Electric was in Phoenix, Arizona. So you don't have to be much of a student of organizations to realize this. <laughs> kind of complicated and, and would, would have problems. Um, and so Multics turned out to be very much more complicated than people had thought. And it just took a very, very long time to come together. And, <clears throat> and partway along, in fact, in probably late 1968, Bell Labs decided that this was not going to fly. And so they withdrew their participation from the Multics project. And this left some of the people who had been working on Multics bereft because they had had a nice big computer provided by GE that did stuff. Um, and they were working on something which was really, really interesting, but all of a sudden it isn't there anymore. And, and this included Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie and Doug McElroy and a handful of other folks. And so they did two things. On one side, they lobbied Bell Labs management for get us a computer so that we can we won't be bereft anymore. We can continue what we were doing. And all we need is half a million dollars in 1969 dollars, which is a lot. Um, and in sort of almost a spare time activity, Ken found what is usually described as a little used PDP-7 and he started doing experiments on file system throughput and you see how fast could you make things go with this, at that point, even obsolete machine. And so he wrote software to do that. And at some point he had this epiphany that he was pretty close to an operating system. And so his wife took their kid off to California to visit relatives. And in three weeks, he put together the first Unix system, which was basically you know, a little bit of operating system, a little bit of shell, a little bit of editor software and, and off it ran. Um, so a well-told, often told tale. And that was the first Unix system. That was, I think, in 1969. Um, and the PDB-7 was <laughs> terribly obsolete and so on. But it was enough impetus that then it started to sound real and with some internal effort 
they managed to get one of the very first PDP 11s, which was an actually much more realistic machine. And the first version of Unix was up and running on that in probably about 1970, 71, something like that. So, 10 first version thereof joined fairly quickly by Dennis, and others can chipping in and contributing bits and pieces. And it all started because of a three week vacation. <laughs> well, this is software productivity in a way that none of, none of us will ever achieve. It's a great story. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's, that's amazing. One of the things that Unix did was it, it, it served as kind of an, an OS that was more friendly to programmers, right? And do you, how, much, how much of that was, how much of that can you attribute to it growing the way that it did? I mean, it was more friendly to programmers. So programmers, programmers could come in and, and add to it. A lot easier than let's say what were the other things at the time fortran and um yeah. oh it mobile. was explicitly designed to be a system for developing programs i mean it really wasn't mm -hmm. to be a programmer's system and can can argue was the best programmer i've ever well certainly the best programmer i've ever met probably one of the best in the world has ever seen it. um and others in that group were no sludges either uh, and this was a tool to amplify their ability to write code and do well. The other thing that went into it, I think, was the sort of a good eye for mechanisms that would actually work well. So finding generalizations that unified and made clean uh, ways of doing things. And I think that the hierarchical file system in Unix is a, probably the neatest example of that. I mean, it's just a very handful of, of primitives, and all of a sudden you've got something you build on top of. Uh, all kinds of things. Yeah, it's it's so interesting when you look back at the history of programming and, and you have so Unix comes out and it does a it does a lot to democratize programming. It makes it easier for people to come in and write new programs. And then eventually you end up with things like C where you get C, C, and now Python, and now we're even at the point where we've got uh a GitHub copilot, which is using AI to to generate code. And anytime I run into an issue and I'm writing a program, I can easily Google it and, and find basically the same exact problem with code already written to do it. So I'm wondering if you've got an opinion on that. Does, you know, I think one of the problems, of course, it's always great to have more people having access to these tools to be able to create the things that they want to create. But I do worry sometimes that we're getting into a, we're getting to a point where there's a lot of people who are writing code that they don't fully understand uh, and so I'm wondering, do you, and you, and you teach computer science now. So I'm wondering, you know, what, what, what approach do you take with this? Uh, do you have an opinion on it? Do you, how do you, how do you inspire your students to go deeper than copying and pasting code <laughs> and pushing yeah. it into production? I, I think that, I think that's an important question and I don't have a solution for it. And one of the nice things about the very early Unix systems was that all the code was right there on the computer. And so you could look at it. And so you could learn from what other people did. And there was also an ethos that said that you could you know, make a better version. So kind of like forking, except that you only you did keep one copy or something. Um, and so if I had an idea to improve a program and I was pretty confident, um, then I could go in and I would make my fixes. And then the program would in theory at least be better. And, and the, discipline that kept this sort of in line was if you touched it last, you own it. And so uh, you, <laughs> you made your changes cautiously. Um, and then there was a period when there was documentation, people used to write down how to do things. And so you would get things like the Unix programmer's manual, which was pretty good for what it did at the time. Um, and it was not the only manuals, but that sort of disappeared after a while with the advent of the basically internet and the ability to get things from somewhere else and, and things like Stack Overflow are a manifestation of that. And Stack Overflow, as everybody knows, is a mixed blessing. Uh, for many things, it's just wonderful. You'll say, ah, here's the error message. Paste it in, search. Oh, here's the answer. Uh, unfortunately, for some of those, that's not the answer. And you spend a lot of time poking around trying to think, what on earth, this, this can't be right, it doesn't fit, it doesn't work in my environment, whatever. Um, and so if you don't understand, if you just paste, then what you come out with is stuff that doesn't work at all. Um, 
I haven't used Copilot, uh, so I don't have a, an informed opinion on that. I've done some sort of minimal experiments with ChatGPT in the same space, and my experience there is that it's just like Stack Overflow. It's often a real win, and sometimes it's not, and it's sometimes hard to tell whether it's right or wrong because it's hallucinating, it's inventing, or it's trained itself on something that isn't right. Um, so I think all of these things are like prosthetic devices. They're helpful, but you still got to actually put something into it yourself. How do you bring up people so that they are at least aware of this? That's an ongoing question. I don't know. I don't teach advanced programming much at this point. I'm more teaching beginning programmer uh, and very non-technical people sometimes. And, and literally right at the moment, I'm wrestling with the question of, okay, here's an assignment I want you to do, and I want you to think about it. I don't want you to, well, do Stack Overflow in olden times, but I don't want you to do ChatGPT in modern times because you won't learn anything from that. And Yeah, the, the worst case is when ChatGPT or Copilot or, or just finding it on the internet and copying and pasting it, the worst case scenario is not even when you when you paste it in and it doesn't run in your environment, the worst case scenario is when it does run, but it gives you the wrong output and you don't understand that it's the wrong output. So, yeah, you know, right. I, I see that a lot. Yeah. Or it gives you the wrong output, but only after you've shipped the product. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Something I want to pick your brain about is for people that are getting into programming. So newer people, be it like uh, 10 years old, 15, 20 years, whatever age they are what would you recommend they start off with? Because if their end goal is to become a, a proficient programmer, would something like C be something they should be learning first? Because the way I look at it, it's like learning Latin. Learning that gives yeah. you a good overall view, of not just the architecture, but how programming started, because a lot of programming languages were developed off C. But some people may say it's a waste of time because there are other languages out there that may be able to do exactly what you can do with C, but there's already... Uh, libraries and functions that are already created and so it's just going to make things much easier but in your pro professional opinion what would you suggest somebody that's just diving into programming and wants to really learn about it where should they start off i think I, it very much depends on who or what it is so i look at myself i'm going to be teaching a class this fall for a bunch of people who are very non-technical it's not a programming class but i want them to understand what computers will do <clears throat> metaphorically, they're English majors, many of them are. Um, I'm going to use Python because that's the easiest thing to get off the ground with, and it has a very rich collection of supporting tools, and you can run it nicely on the web through something like Colab. So, so for that group, Python is a real win, and it gives them an entree to all kinds of things like um, data analysis software, uh, natural language processing, and um, graphing, and all kinds of stuff like that. Uh, they wouldn't get that with C or C++ or, in fact, any other language they might use without being buried in other things. Um, <clears throat> but if I were teaching people who were nominally going to go on and be, let's say, computer science majors, Python has some drawbacks because, well, back to what we were just talking about, you can write code that looks good on the surface and it breaks a month from now because of some weird case that what you know because the, there's no type checking to speak of and so you just never exercise that path. so our introductory course at princeton uses java and you know java in some ways is like walking through glue because there's so much syntax but it slaps your wrist when you do something dumb and it has a lot of libraries and, and so on it's just a heavy lift for my English majors, but it's probably just fine for the potential computer science majors. So, but as I say, if I'm gonna start with, you know, let's say high school, college age kids, Python seems like the right answer. If I'm gonna start with kids, I'd probably do Scratch, but that's a different story entirely. That's what my, my daughter started on. She started on Scratch. And yeah. I, I somebody sent me a text message to ask you a question, thoughts on Rust. Uh, I tried Rust about, oh, geez, six, seven years ago, I guess. Um, and I couldn't grok it. 
And I couldn't find documentation because the language was changing so rapidly that you would, well, you'd, you're the Stack Overflow question, you go to Stack Overflow or even to the official Rust documentation and you get something that just didn't work because the version had, you know, something had evolved. Um, and so I never really quite got it. The other thing is that downloading a Rust environment, I think it was like a, I can't remember, but it was sort of like almost like Xcode size. It was just bizarrely big. And I, to do nothing, I just wanted to compile a one line Rust program and I had to get a gigabyte of stuff. And, and so um, I've put it on the back burner as something that I suppose an informed computer science person ought to be able to write code in, but I just, I, life's too short. I'm not going to bother. So it, sorry, Dad. It needs, uh, oh, sorry, Lynn. No, go ahead. It's all yours. I was just going to say, Russ needs someone to write uh, a book about it. <laughs> That's what we need. But, <laughs> go for it. But yeah, I've, I've also no experience with Rust, but um, it is, as I poke around different languages, it's always like the, the level of documentation is so important. I remember when I was, uh, one of the labs I was working in, the treadmill that we had was controlled by uh, a piece of software that was written in Lua. And um, I had never, never programmed in Lua before. And I, yeah, I was able to pick it up like in a day, our treadmill broke, whatever program we had running. Uh, I believe one of the lab interns deleted it on accident and I was able to recreate it pretty easily just because the it's pretty well documented. So, No, I have a standard test case that I used for some combination of what does the language look like in a small program and how fast might it run. And it's basically a trivial formatter where you just hand it, you know, lines of words and it produces things where the lines are no more than somewhat. So it's like the flow in a, a HTML browser interface. Um, and I've written that in probably 25 different languages. And the, that's the one I tried to write in Rust and it took me a couple of days to get it right. Um, Lua, which I had also never written code in, I looked at the manual and I had it up and running in probably an hour or two. Um, and if you want, <laughs> want to irritate a different set of people, um, I tried it in Haskell. It took me several weeks. So then I guess one follow-up question I have, I mean, it's kind of somewhat related to this because I've been a proponent of free and open source software. I talk about it fondly just for a variety of reasons. And given with that, and Linux is very much associated with free and open source software, what are your thoughts on Linux? Do you use it? Do you have any good memories with it? I mean, given the fact that you have seen the development of Unix right from the get-go and Linux mirrors it to a degree, I just want to hear your thoughts about it. Oh, I, I, it, it's an indispensable part of the world. I use it all the time. I'm sitting here, I'm, you can't see it, but I'm looking, I have Mac, mostly uh, I have Mac Air because I can carry them around. Um, and so underneath that, that's some flavor of unix like software, but the local computer service in the computer science department here runs on Linux. And so mostly what I have open are terminal windows that are connected to a perfectly fine Linux system. Hmm. In a lot of cases, they behave essentially identically. I don't think about it at all. I'm running Bash in both of them, or any C programs or Python programs or Aqua scripts or whatever. And you know, they just work essentially the same in the two environments. And in fact, I color code my terminal window so I can remember which system a particular one is on. <clears throat> so no, I use Linux all the time. I think we'd be remiss not to talk a little bit about uh you're writing, you're a prolific writer. How many books have you published? Um, well, it depends how you count. Do you count second editions? Okay, so here comes a commercial announcement. <laughs> or you guys could do an ad at the beginning. I could do an ad. In the <laughs> Go ahead. It's all yours. Yeah. Yeah. Go for yeah. it. Um, so Al Aho and Peter Weinberger and I have finished a second edition of the Ock book, and that will show up at the end of September. So please, everybody who's listening, if there is anybody, uh, go buy it. Um, <laughs> And so there's second editions like that, but you know, it's call it a dozen, give or take, uh, things like that. And so, and that that's been I, I think the first one I wrote was in the 1970-ish or something like that. So it's about 50 years of book 
writing in there. Is that something that's, do you find that writing comes naturally to you? I don't, you don't find a lot of uh, very good like programmers that are also good at writing. Does that, has writing always come natural to you? Is it, is it something that you enjoy doing? It's something that I enjoy doing. I, I, natural is hard to say, but um, I think it's an ecological niche. Many of the people that I have worked with, uh, Ken, for example, um, do not like to write at all. Yeah. And so, <laughs> so he's many orders of magnitude better programmer than I am, but I'm probably an order of magnitude better writer than he is. Uh, Dennis was a, a a rare combination of somebody who could do both, because an absolute first rate uh, programmer, but also an absolute first rate writer. Um, so not many people hit that. And you know, I would call myself at best an average programmer, but you know, writing does come fairly easily uh, by comparison, at least. I think you're yeah, I've, 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 <laughs> ahead, I've always, I always found. Uh, like in, in academia, there was people that were very technical, but then when it came to actually writing papers and publishing, I knew people that were seven, eight year PhD students just because they wouldn't sit down and write their dissertations, you know? So you know, it's always, it's always uh, cool to see someone that can excel in both, both areas. I'm going to put you on the spot and I'm sorry to do this. In terms of your professional career, what would you say is your proudest accomplishment? Well, it's hard to say. There are things that I am pretty happy with. Um, the book that Dennis and I wrote uh, is certainly one of them. Uh, and that was a nice blend of two people. Um, the reference manual that Dennis wrote is a perfectly good example of his writing, which is incredibly precise and careful, but still easy to read. Um, and the more tutorial stuff, most of which I wrote, is more like my style. Um, so that one is one that I'm particularly happy with. Um, I'm also pretty happy with the awk, both the language and the book that Al and Peter and I worked on because that seems to have scratched an itch for a lot of people, but the language in particular is still, still pretty widely used. Uh, and uh, I think it's useful for the kinds of things it does. So those are two things that I would <clears throat> say are particularly uh, you know, they worked out pretty well. Um, mm. And then there's a lot of other stuff that's sort of okay, but it's not a big deal. Okay. I've, I've heard you tell a few stories about Auk. Um, I'm wondering if you could just kind of tell us what, where, where did it come from? What, what inspired you to, to build it? And uh, you said it's still pretty widely used and that you've got a second edition of the book coming out, which I'm guessing means that there are some newly added features. So I guess, how did it start and where is it today? Yeah, so it started... Um, when Al and Peter and I were all at the labs and uh, at some point in the process, we were actually in three adjacent offices. Um, and we were talking about things that interested us that were not properly served by existing programming languages. Because at the time it was really only C, that's what you work with, or Fortran if you were in the punch card environment kind of uh, mindset. Um, and I was interested in some kind of language that would manipulate strings, that is characters, with the same facility as numbers. And C was very good for numbers, but it was kind of a nightmare to, to do string processing, text processing kind of stuff. Um, Al was very much interested in regular expressions, pattern matching, things like that. He had written egrep, which was the state of the art in pattern matching at that point. This is sort of 1976. Um, and Peter was very interested in database kinds of things. And he'd written a little relational database system for Unix and, you know, very interested in that kind of stuff, report generation. And so Aachen is this kind of odd mishmash of those things put together. It manipulates numbers and text with more or less equal facility. Uh, regular expression matching is an integral part of the language in a lot of different ways. Um, and then that sort of <clears throat> pattern action paradigm of just streaming input past selector mechanisms and summarizing or doing things to it um, is sort of reminiscent of 
database report generation kinds of things. So that's the genesis of it. And we talked about it for probably a fairly short period of time. I don't remember, but certainly not more than um, probably a few weeks as a guest. And then one weekend, Peter went home and implemented it. Um, and, <clears throat> and then <laughs> the rest is history. Uh, it got used by a lot of people. We had thought of it originally as a language for basically one line programs where you wanted to select all the lines that had some property or maybe two lines because you wanted to summarize something. Um, and so we were pretty surprised when people started writing bigger OCK programs, the only kind that would be a page or then thousand lines of OCK programs. It just was never meant for that kind of thing. Um, and realistically, it still isn't. Today, if I was going to write something that was a thousand lines, I would not do it in OCK. I would write it in Python. Um, <clears throat> But at the time, it hit a kind of nice you know, sweet spot because it was interpreted. It wasn't compiled, so that, and there were no object files or anything like that. So we had this program and just said, you know, awk, and then you type the program and then list the file names and off it went. And so it was very, very interactive in that sense. Um, and so lots of people found it useful and it was easy to learn because it was culturally compatible and the regular expressions were the same that you already used. And the, the action language looked very much like C, and you know it fit in Unix environment because it was you know name of program followed by list of files. So all of that stuff uh, made it pretty smooth and easy to use for most people. So and it's actually been quite static. I've taken a Al and Peter have not been doing very uh, much of anything on uh, maintenance or anything like that. And the real in the real world, most people use uh, Gawk, the GNU version of Gawk, which Arnold Robbins does a magnificent job of keeping going. Um, and I've taken a fairly hard line on, you know, adding more and more and more features. And Arnold supports that. Gawk has lots of stuff, but there's a flag that says, don't add all that stuff, just keep it sort of compatible. Um, but what we <clears throat> what was has been added over the last year or year and a half or something like that. Two things that I think are relevant. One is uh, support for UTF-8 uh, because you know, Aqua was written well before Unicode came along, and so, and in fact, well before anybody realized that other parts of the world use different characters. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so Aq now supports that is this version supports uh, UTF-8 for input and regular expressions and stuff like that. Um, and the other thing is something that also <laughs> wasn't around until very, very late in the game, which is uh, comma separated variables, CSV. And, you know, spreadsheets especially produce CSV and accept CSV, and it's been always a nuisance to process that kind of stuff. So there's a, you know, there's a, a, a flag or an option or something now in this version that says we'll process CSV for you on input. Mm. And that's really all it is. So, and, and you know, minor cleanup, so little things, but nothing, nothing substantial. Gotcha. Well, I've got. I think Len has one question. And I've got one question, and uh, and we won't take up too much more of your time. But mm -hmm. you told a story on. Uh, I'm blanking on the name of the podcast now. It's uh, a trouble at work. You told a story about uh, how grep was. Uh, how how grep was, I guess, created, and then there's a funny anecdote about it not really being asked for, but it just being created. But it was Ken Thompson that created it, right? Yeah. And he, he he created it to do something on his own. And then he was asked to basically create it and he promised it overnight and he, <laughs> he delivered it, right? So I'm wondering, yeah. do you have any anything that you created, any programs that you wrote to do something personally or just for fun that you never pushed to production and a few years later you saw someone else produce it? No, I don't think so. I mean... <laughs> And I'm not sure even if I did, I, the, the story would be one of these things where I'm remembering it wrong because I remember the end story wrong and he told it correctly. I, and then I said, oh my God, I've been wrong all these years. Because <laughs> I thought he, he went home and did it on demand, but instead of just stalling overnight to deliver something he'd already written. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't think I have anything uh, <laughs> it's such a neat story as that, sadly. So I have one final question because we have you for an hour and I want to respect your time because you are a very busy person for people who aren't aware. 
he came right from an interview, sorry, from a meeting shortly before coming on this interview. So Brian is very busy as it is. But for you, Brian, hello world. Apparently you're credited for creating that. Is this true or not? Uh, yes, it's true or not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> my memory, and, and this is another one of these things where, you know, there are tracks in my brain because this question has been asked and enough times that you, you have no idea whether it's true or recovered memory or what. But my memory <clears throat> is that somewhere I saw a cartoon that showed a chick coming out of an egg, you know, pop through the eggs and the caption was hello world. And I have no idea what it was about. I've never been able to find that or anything like it, but it was sort of the first example that I used in a manual for the B language, which Ken Thompson had done, um, you know, just to say, here's how you produce a line of output. And then it sort of got carried into the C tutorial and the C book and et cetera. Um, so that's my memory of it. But Martin Richards, who did BCPL at, at the University of Cambridge and also worked uh, for a year, I guess, at Multics, uh, I think there's some claim to it from him, but he's a gentleman and a scholar, and he says, no, no, no. So, so the short answer is I honestly don't know at this point. And if somebody could track it down, that would be great. But <laughs> you, you can't get a you can't get an accurate answer from me, let alone an honest one. <laughs> well, we're going to say yes. You are the creator of this. <laughs> we'll have to copyright that for everybody that's going to write that, that program moving forward. You get royalties as a result. So, yeah, right. uh, Brian, I want to thank you very much and Daniel as well for coming on the show. For people who are, are not aware, uh, Professor Kernan is still teaching computer science at Princeton. So, people who are attending that school, obviously, you've enrolled in classes by now. Perhaps you are going to be one of the lucky few that are going to be attending his class and listening to him speak about computer science. So, Brian, thank you very much for coming on our show. We're very grateful for you. Man, Daniel, that. thank you very much. Very great fun. Good luck with it all. And hope to talk to you again someday. Take care. Thank you, Brian.